it's a great pleasure to be here with you, and uh, I hope in the next hour and a half, we will be able to explain to you what RMB internationalization means and what opportunities it presents to businesses in UK and elsewhere. And in that context, how Hong Kong can help the UK and other places to develop the businesses, the investment and trade links with Hong Kong and China. Uh, what I propose to do is to divide this session into three parts. The first part will be a very short video on RMB internationalization and Hong Kong's role. And second, I'll make a very short presentation and then followed by a panel discussion. Uh, we will have uh, four panelists joining us they will be making remarks and then followed by question and answers. I will divide my presentation in four parts. The first part is to just remind people uh, China's growth story, the basic facts, past, present and future. And second, to talk about Hong Kong's roles in China's growth story. And then the third part, talk about internationalization, RMB and what does it mean for global businesses. And finally, Hong Kong, what Hong Kong can do to serve overseas banks and customers in developing offshore RMB businesses. Very simple facts about China's growth story. Uh, Deng Xiaoping launched the opening reform program campaign in 1979, but basically from 1980, in a period of three decades, 30 years, China's GDP, nominal GDP, grew by 18 times from just about $300 billion to almost $6 trillion, overtaking Japan as the second largest economy in the world and the world's biggest exporter. That's past, and looking forward, based on IMF estimates, in the next few years, China's contribution to global growth would gradually increase to about 36% by year 2016. And this contrasts with the 13% contribution of China to global growth in 2000 and 23% in 2005. Now, given the very marked uh, slowdown of economic growth in the United States, Europe, and Japan in recently, it is likely the global engine for growth will have to rest with the emerging market economies in particular to China. As a result of this very, very fast economic growth, there's been a phenomenal increase in trade and the investment. Let me talk about trade. Trade between China and the rest of the world increased by five times within a period of 10 years. And last year, 2010, the total trade of China amounted to three trillion US dollars. And you can see from this slide, uh, the, the phenomenal growth has been actually universal. Doesn't matter which is Australia, ASEAN, Europe, Japan, and Latin America, this phenomenal growth in trade. Now, let me talk about investment. We also talk about very, very rapid investment uh, uh, links. Uh, of course, we all are familiar with the story that China has been able to achieve this economic miracle mainly because it has been very successful in attracting foreign investments. When foreign investment comes into China, it brings about not only capital, but much needed technology and management expertise. And as a result, the manufacturing sector of China has become very, very competitive and uh, of a world standard. So this is the data of the FDIs into China in the last 10 years. You can see uh, it's been steadily rising in the last year. Uh, the amount every year amounted to 100 billion US dollars. What I want to draw your attention is that something people pay less attention to is the overseas direct investment from mainland China. Because you look at this number, the yellow bars, prior to 2004, five, there's virtually very little ODIs from China. But this has changed. In the last three years, you can see the amount of ODIs from China to the rest of the world actually rose very sharply and approaching $60 billion, uh, 2010. So I won't be surprised in a few years' time, 
given the rapid rate of increase of ODIs, ODI will probably equal to FDIs or even surpass FDI into China. So it's a very, very major development there. And that is a very uh, brief recap of China's growth story, past, present, and future. So what does that mean for us? What does it mean for businesses in UK and elsewhere? I suppose the choice is quite simple. You can choose to be a very passive, innocent bystander, or you want to be part of China's growth story. To me, the answer is very simple. I chose the latter. But the big question is, how does one do that? How, how does one go about in achieving this uh, goal? How can I become part of China's growth story and share the benefits this growth engine will bring about? Now, I have come to my second part of the presentation, which is Hong Kong's role in China's growth story. First of all, I want to talk about trade. Uh, for a long time, Hong Kong has been the gateway for China's trade with the Western world. In the 90s, Hong Kong's share of China's total trade, if you count re-exports and also offshore trade, it was about 50%. But given the rapid expansion of China's trade, the percentage of share has come down, although the absolute amount has risen. Hong Kong now intermediate about 30% of China's external trade. In the FD9 numbers I've just shown you, very impressive 100 billion US dollars a year, the source, the main source of FDIs into China has been Hong Kong. It's a very, very distant number one, accounting almost 60% of FDIs into China. When I say FDI, it doesn't mean Hong Kong indigenous companies. It can be British, it can be Japanese, it can be American, provided they domicile, they register in corporate Hong Kong, is counted as Hong Kong originated FDIs. But what is interesting, if you look at the uh, ODIs I just talked about, it was 60 billion last year, but surprisingly, 60% went to Hong Kong. But of course, it's, went to Hong Kong doesn't mean the money is actually invested in Hong Kong. A lot of this investment actually come through Hong Kong, using Hong Kong as a base, as a springboard to reach out to other places like Latin America, Australia, or even Europe. It does therefore tell you the role, the intermediation role that Hong Kong is playing in China's trade and investment flows. A quick word on the, this important subject, equity funding. Uh, since 1993, Hong Kong has been a very, very important fundraising center for mainland companies through the Stock Exchange of Hong Kong. Our last count is about 380 billion US dollars of equity fund funding raised in Hong Kong. IPOs, rights issue, different forms. And you can see in Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index, uh, about 60% of the Hang Seng Index actually came from mainland companies. Now come to my third part of my presentation, internationalization R&B. In, to me, it's a new era for China's growth story. The growth momentum is there, no doubt about it, but what is giving is additional, additional power is actually this internationalization. What does that mean? For a long time, RMB is actually a currency used basically in mainland China on the onshore market. Offshore market, there's basically nothing. And there's a huge river segregating the onshore and offshore markets. So what internationalization means is actually building a bridge or bridges linking the onshore RMB market with offshore, allowing RMB to flow from onshore market to offshore market and back. This is basically internationalization is the simplest concept. But I would actually uh, use the analogy of three types of bridges which will link the onshore and offshore markets. The first bridge is the trade flows, the bridge for trade, trade flows. The second is a bridge for investment flows. FDIs into China, ODIs from, from China to the rest of the world. And the third one is for pan portfolio flows or financial market flows. Let me talk about trade flows. Prior to 2010, um, there was virtually very little or none, no trade settled in RMB, despite China being the biggest exporter in the world. But starting from 
Last year, first quarter, out of total trade in China, we have 0.4% settled in RMB, the rest in US dollars, Euro, Hong Kong dollars, other foreign currencies. And second quarter, 1%, and then it jumped to 2.4 and 5.7. And this year, first quarter, it jumped the share to 6.8, and second quarter, 10.2. You can see from a zero base, the amount of trade settled in RMB has been rising steadily and very uh, quickly. And this presents enormous opportunities for companies, businesses with trade links with China. Because settlement in trade, as we mentioned in the video, would greatly increase settlement and payment efficiency. Some bankers have put an estimate that the cost that one can save by using RMB will be around 7% of the value of the trade. That's a huge saving. Direct investment, um, the People's Bank of China promulgated a new set of rules allowing ODI in RMB to be used offshore, and this is beginning to take place. The rules are there. It's up to the uh, companies and banks to, use this, to make use of these rules to promote the use of RMB. For FDI in China, in the past, it's always been US dollars, foreign currency, nothing else. So far, companies can raise RMB funding in Hong Kong and remit them into China for investment projects but on a case-by-case -case basis. Beijing had recently, uh, through Vice Premier Li Keqiang's visit to Hong Kong, uh, affirmed its intention to promulgate a new set of rules allowing RMB FDIs. This is very good news. Once a new set of rules are promulgated, we have much greater certainty that companies with RMB funding offshore can use that funding to make payments for their projects in mainland China. And finally, the portfolio flows, uh, the developments is that uh, overseas monetary authorities, including HKMA, has been given quotas to invest in RMB in the bank bond market. Uh, this is a part of the first move, and some banks, clearing Bank Hong Kong, have been given quotas as well to access the uh, RMB bond market in the mainland. And also, we are hopeful that the RMB, or called the QFI, this portfolio investment in China by foreigners will be introduced also very soon. Now, how Hong Kong can help in terms of helping overseas centers to develop their RMB businesses? This is the chart showing that the portion of RMB trade settlement handled by banks in Hong Kong you can see the ratio has been very high and it's over 80% of RMB settlements handled through Hong Kong. And in terms of RMB liquidity, we have since 2004 um, a limited scheme to allow Hong Kong citizens to open RMB account with banks. And that trend, you can see this blue bars represent the amount of deposit of citizens of Hong Kong. But what is significant is that with trade settlement, the amount of corporate customer deposits grew very, very sharply. At the moment, we have over 50, 570 billion yuan of RMB deposits in Hong Kong, 70% of which belong to corporate customers. And a lot of these corporate customers obtain the RMB funding through because they're net receiver of trade settlement in RMB. But I want to highlight is that among those corporate customer deposits, around 19 to 20% belong to corporates overseas. That means corporates not based in Hong Kong, opening bank accounts with banks in Hong Kong and place the surplus RMB funding with Hong Kong. That indicate how Hong Kong banks are helping to provide offshore RMB businesses to overseas customers. Dim sum bond, um, with this huge amount of RMB liquidity, Funding cost is very low and attractive. We have a large number of uh, international issuers tapping the Hong Kong market. Uh, in the first eight months of this year, we have 55 issuers issuing amount of 70 billion yuan of RMB bonds, including 20 billion yuan of sovereign bonds issued by China's Ministry of Finance. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I would just say, in RMB internationalization signifies a new era of opportunities of fostering trade investment links with China and the Western world. And in this context, Hong Kong 
is the center for intermediate trade investment links between China and the Western world. I think later on, through our panel discussions, we explain in greater detail how Hong Kong can support overseas markets to develop the offshore RMB business to meet the need of the customer in terms of trade and investment. So what I propose to do is that I would invite the four panelists uh, to make some remarks in turn, each of them about five minutes. And then after the, uh, the remarks, we then open the floor for question and answers. I hope this will be a truly interactive process. And therefore, please, please uh, uh, send in your question if you have any. Uh, I think the first one, uh, Gary, can you uh, explain to the uh, audience uh, the unique features and the services that the clearing platform, RMB clearing platform in Hong Kong can offer? Uh, in terms of uh, for what does it mean for businesses and, uh, and banks in overseas? Okay, thank you, Norman. Uh, as everyone knows that for any currency, there must be an effective and efficient clearing system before you can get any business done to settle your trade, to do money transfer, you know, things like that. And the clearing settlement, the clearing uh, function platform in Hong Kong was initiated in 2004 when Hong Kong just started doing individual retail RMB business. And then later on, it was expanded to corporate business, as Norman mentioned, in 2009. Trade settlement were allowed by the Chinese authority in RMB, in offshore market. So we, see, we saw gradual increase and a sudden jump in 2010 uh, in trade settlement and other associated business. The clearing bank function in Hong Kong, now the Bank of China Hong Kong, is the only clearing bank, but of course I'm sure our competitors beside me will certainly want to have that function as well, but uh, unfortunately it's highly policy driven and uh, one of the advantage, uh, advantages of the current clearing system is that, number one, uh, the system itself is linked to a domestic RMB settlement system. In China, there is a system called CNAPS, China National Advanced Payment System. And that China National Advanced Payment System, actually, is the RMB clearing system in onshore market and that system actually is able to clear RMB among all the branches of the central banks in all the provinces and through them for all the commercial banks around the country. So the clearing system in Hong Kong now it's currently, well actually ever since 2004, had been linked, in, uh, linked with a SNAP system, providing real-time, very effective clearing services throughout China. In other words, if you're able, if you want to send the instruction to the clearing bank, and that clearing bank, us, is going to, okay, uh, uh, forward this instruction through PPOC, and then send the instruction to CNAPS, and instantly this transaction could be processed, and the fund will go wherever you want the money to go to. So that is one thing. Without that, of course, you know, it's not only an offshore clearing system. Actually, it's the clearing system linking the offshore and onshore markets. So that's one thing. The other thing, actually, is in Hong Kong, we, we have a system called RGTS, real-time gross, real gross payment system. You know, something like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> RG RTGS, real-time gross settlement system. Okay. Sorry, you know, get it wrong. <laughs> uh, you know, actually, it's a multi-currency real-time settlement system. And with that system, previously, we were able to settle US dollar, Hong Kong dollar, Euro. But now, RMB is also included on that platform. So if you do transactions, cross-currency transactions, between US dollar and RMB, or other currencies in RMB, you can get it settled instantly without incurring too much settlement risk. Otherwise, you don't have to wait until the end of the day. As long as the transactions, all the counterparties actually within Hong Kong will be able to settle the trades right in Hong Kong. 
But of course, you know, if you want to get transaction done between Hong Kong and the mainland, or between the UK and the mainland, of course, you have to use the synapse to get it settled. So that is, uh, that is the other thing. As I said at the beginning, R&B business is highly policy-driven, and is also very closely monitored by the authorities in China, PBOC. So, you know, when you have some transaction, particularly foreign, ex transa foreign exchange transactions, and then, you know, there are two prices. There is onshore price, there is an offshore price, foreign exchange transactions, for foreign exchange transactions. And normally, the onshore market is less expensive than the offshore market. In other words, if you want to buy RMB, you may have to pay a bit more in the offshore market. But there is an exception for trade settlement transactions. Within a certain quota limit, you're able to enjoy the onshore market exchange rate through the clearing bank. But of course, I have to emphasize, it must be within that limit. There's a quota assigned by PBOC to the clearing bank saying, hey, you know, this is the total amount of foreign exchange exposure. In other words, you know, for the entire offshore market, that exposure, that's what we want to take. And then as long as the, the transactions, the accumulated volume of the transactions and accumulated cumulative exposure of the foreign exchange is under that quotas, will allow you to use the onshore domestic foreign exchange rate to do transactions. So as long as, you know, because we do transactions with all the uh, participating banks, I'm sorry, you know, there's a certain definition here I have to mention. PBOC is the clearing bank. All the other banks who's clear, who clear through PB, uh, no, uh, clearing bank, BOCHK is the clearing bank. And all the other banks, all the other banks who clear through BOCHK is called participating bank. So the other participating banks, when they do transactions through us, and then we'll be able to know the overall net exposure of this RMB onshore trade settlement for RMB onshore trade settlement. So in that case, you know, whenever the aggregated transaction daily or weekly or even monthly is beneath that, and as long as there's a trade background behind the transfer, and then we'll be able to do the foreign exchange transactions with an onshore foreign exchange rate. So that is another adva uh, advantage. And, uh, and if you become a participating bank in the clearing system in Hong Kong, you're entitled to apply for investment quotas from PBOC. From time to time, PBOC would grant the participating banks some investment quotas to allow you to use some of your RMB deposits to make investment in China, in the Chinese domestic, domestic bond market. You know, you're entitled, but whether they actually or finally grant you that quota or not is another issue. Okay, some of the participating banks in Hong Kong, like, you know, Standard Chart and HSBC, they've all been granted this investment quotas from PPOC, and other local players uh, have got the approval as well. So there's a possibility if you use a Hong Kong clearing bank, there's a possibility that you can apply for investment quotas. As everyone knows, the investment you in China, of course, inflation and things like that, investment you in China is much higher than the offshore market, so you can use some of your funds to enjoy high yield investment. That's another advantage. And the liquidity issue. As Norman mentioned, currently we have roughly about 570 billion RMB in deposits for the entire Hong Kong. And that is roughly about 9% of the entire Hong Kong customer, uh, customer deposit base. And it's still growing. So if you participate, if you join the Hong Kong clearing system, and you will naturally be able to enjoy a very deep liquidity pool there. For instance, you know, in the offshore market, if you do money market transactions, foreign exchange transactions, FDI or uh, 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 NDF or DF, whatever transactions, as long as 
offshore, and there's no control. You enjoy all freedom, actually. And, uh, but of course, you, know, you can only use the offshore price. You can't use the onshore price. For instance, the offshore price for an exchange, you know, it's more expensive than the onshore market. And interest rates, money market interest rates in Hong Kong, it's lower. So if you're a borrower from, you know, borrower of RMB to use Hong Kong offshore market, you can enjoy lower cost. And that's why, you know, a lot of the bond issuers were attracted to Hong Kong to make, uh, make various kinds of bonds issues uh, just to enjoy the low funding cost. So the liquidity over there is very deep. And the, domestic, uh, the, the offshore market, actually, caught sort of a vast pool of fund there. So if there is any need for funding, I think it will be easier to get it in Hong Kong than other places. Mm -hmm. And then finally, there's another point that is highly technical. Remember, I mentioned about the CNAP system in China, the China, Chinese National Advanced Payment System, okay, CNAP system. Uh, if you join the Hong Kong clearing platform, you will be able to get, get what they call the CNAPS code. And that code actually is the identity of any of the participating, uh, participating bank. It's the unique identity. All the participants of the CNAPS in domestic market actually have their own codes. So with that code, and if you, you are assigned a code like that, you'll be able to settle between yourself and the other banks in China in a very efficient, effective way. So these are advantages, but of course, you know, if you choose to uh, clear through some other banks here in the UK, but of course, you know, they can always try to provide the service, you know, they get the service, and then we, you know, tr in fact, they will, they will try to get the service through us. And of course, you know, I'm sure some of you are bankers. I'm not trying to get the business away from, from you, but, uh, you know, these are the actual facts. I just want to let you know there are certainly a lot of advantages to have a direct clearing accounts with us. Gary's done a great job explaining why a bank should join as clearing bank, at, at accessing uh, the Bank of China, Hong Kong's um, platform. But what if customers corporate customers with trade investment links with China or banks with customer demand somehow prefer not to join as a participant bank and what can banks like HSBC do to help them to, to meet the customer demand, the growing customer demand and develop the offshore RMB business? Can you, can you say a few words on that? Sure, thanks, uh, thanks Norman. Um, okay, I, I think there's two parts. You know, the first part of the question is uh, what services can, can banks in Hong Kong? Definitely, you know, HSBC is very keen, and so are you know, Standard Chartered and Bank of China. Other banks in the other parts of, of the world, and also what can banks you know, with a global network like you know, us can actually help corporates uh, to facilitate their needs in terms of whether it's trade or investments you know, with China in renminbi. So let me address the first, uh, uh, first part of the, of the situation. Um, banks offer, you know, banks in the other parts of the world. I think naturally, I think uh, three areas that I want to highlight. Number one, um, banks in Hong Kong benefit from Hong Kong being Hong Kong. I think in the uh, morning sessions, you know, when the very speakers actually talk about Hong Kong, Hong Kong has actually established, I would say, an unrivaled credentials in terms of the leading, you know, RMB hub. Now, this is something that we have to. Uh, continue to defend and, and get better. But currently, clearly, we are the leading uh, remedy hub. And uh, we have a very supportive regulatory environment, infrastructure, clearing system, you know, RTGS, and also the, um, the China 12-5-year uh, uh, plan, and also the recent visit uh, by the Vice Premier, Li Keqiang, also reaffirmed that Hong Kong will be supported to continue to be developed as a leading offshore RMB center. Now, the other thing is, um, uh, in Hong Kong, you also do have key financial institutions, definitely at HSBC. We take it very seriously, so that's why we have been clearly make every single effort to be involved in the entire development you know, of 
the renminbi internationalization and also opening up. So there's a lot of experience within the system. But actually, what are some of the benefits and capabilities that we in banks in Hong Kong can offer you know, banks in the rest of the world? Now, for banks in the rest of the world, clearly, they are also serving customers. Broadly speaking, you can say that banks in the rest of the world you know, have institutional clients and also they have corporate customers. If we look at institutional clients, there will be a need about renminbi clearing and custody service. So instead of opening a direct clearing account as, as a participating bank, if they actually has not yet gravitated to the level of critical mass, they probably would like to basically open an account with an existing bank in Hong Kong that have got every access in terms of the REM capability. Uh, that can provide you with trade facilities, uh, trade settlement facilities. They can provide you with balanced you know, reporting services. And also, um, the demand for renminbi investment products, wealth management services, is also growing. For example, we ourselves in the global asset management is going to sell renminbi bond funds in Europe by the end of this year. So uh, this banks in the rest of the world can also actually offer these products that is actually manufactured by banks in Hong Kong uh, for their clients. Now, the other parts uh, um, for banks uh, uh, overseas is uh, how to service their corporate customers. Now, the corporate customer needs, uh, naturally, one of the key area is in trade. In the trade services, um, we would have the capability to have non-resident accounts for payments and receivables, discounting and also opening the renminbi DC documentary credits, and also because of the development of the offshore renminbi products in Hong Kong as a hub, you actually do have a complete array, as complete as the current regulations allowed in terms of on the liability management side, i.e. the hedging side, whether it's FX risk, interest rate risk that involve renminbi, and on the investment side, whether your corporate is actually through trade that actually they have you know, receipts in renminbi they want to invest, whether it's in bonds, deposits, structured deposits that is actually denominated in renminbi or renminbi linked in Hong Kong. Now that essentially is about how can banks outside of Hong Kong use us in Hong Kong you know, as a step, as a very effective uh, uh, channel. Then, then, then what about, you know, corporates, you know, and um, uh, uh, banks, you know, uh, in Hong Kong, you know, how will we be able to actually service corporates um, overseas to facilitate the trade investment needs in China, in renminbi? Now, I think it's, uh, uh, this point has been highlighted actually early this morning uh, by uh, uh, my chairman, you know, uh, Douglas. Um, it's about bringing the uh, local market knowledge and also international connectivity. Now, this point is actually very, very key, particularly when we're talking about an emerging market. Now, China obviously is an emerging market of its own class because it actually is a major uh, engine in terms of the uh, growing market. But you do need to have local expertise on the ground staff to actually help you to sort out Anything from the simple like opening accounts, you know, sorting out kind of details, cut off time in terms of settlements, uh, to the other end in terms of dealing with regulators in various compliance issues. And I think the other thing is the on the ground support can actually help customers overseas in introducing, you know, your supply chain, whether it's suppliers or retailings that we know operating locally to provide that link. And then I think the other thing is, in any of the growing emerging market, it's important to be involved you know, from the very beginning all along so that you have the first mover advantage. I think uh, definitely for HSBC and I think for you know, the three major banks that you are seeing, every single one of us is very focused in making sure that we are engaged in whatever development that we can be involved in the RAMMI process. So you actually have a a wealth of knowledge that you can actually use in tapping as compared to, I think, when we're being asked about how Hong Kong compared with some of the key financial centers in the region. I think it's the early involvement 
commitment and the closeness with the market actually has built up a huge pool of the knowledge base. Now, uh, this is, we also need to do communication to make uh, our capability more known you know, to uh, the overseas corporates. And hence, I think there's various kind of roadshows. Uh, Norman mentioned about, you know, uh, uh, when we're discussing about the Russian, uh, the, the roadshow in Russia, you know, uh, TDC and also HKMA. I think banks like ourselves also participate in the roadshow. And I think earlier, uh, a month ago, um, we actually have a team flying in to London uh, with uh, some of our experts within uh, HSBC uh, in both the, uh, the trading side and also product side together with the team in London to actually not only to market to corporates but actually meeting uh, a group of 50 journalists, European journalists, so that they actually understand the product better so that when they actually write they can write a true story about the capabilities that Hong Kong can offer to actually help us to communicate you know, that idea. Now, I think the other thing is to helping overseas clients to tap China and likewise to tap uh, Chinese customers to tap overseas. Um, the other whole array of things that I think the, the banks uh, with a global international network in Hong Kong can help corporates in tapping you know, trade investment naturally would also come along with the fact that you know, Hong Kong now actually is the center point of all the development of any of the offshore RMB product development, whether it's you know, equities, whether it's fixed income, you know, whether it's liability side. Uh, and if you look at the dim sum bond development uh, that is in the earliest line, it has grown you know, exponentially. But this is not only in size, not only in quantity, but also in quality in terms of the diversity of the underlying issuers coming to Hong Kong. I think so far up to date, you already have a very colorful mix of issuers, be it is from you know, state-owned enterprises, uh, policy banks, you know, uh, some familiar names like European you know, issuers like um, uh, Unilever, uh, Tesco, uh, Australian entities like Fonterra, you know, high yield to entities like Galaxy, to name it. So it's not about like monotone, you know, uh, market. So actually it can provide investors with different risk appetite to actually go into this particular market and RMB equities is obviously developing. And, and I think we are anticipating the RMB, the IPO uh, size and also the turnover 2015 probably account for anything close to 15 to 20% of the entire, you know, market. Now that is substantial growth. Now this would only continue. But I think, as I mentioned, it's an emphasis in terms of the quality of the underlying growth instead of just pure quantity. With that, thank you. Thank you, Anita. Are uh, you already touching the subject of the next panelist? So, uh, Ben, can you uh, say a few words and explain the, the, the market for RB financing, in particular the dim sum bond market in Hong Kong? Sure, Norman, thanks. Um, um, it's a very timely question because I literally just spent uh, the last week um, visiting a lot of clients in North America and now in London and Europe. And I must say the, the interest um, in this area as well as the response in this area has been literally phenomenal everywhere I've, I've visited. Um, uh, I think our, the whole RMB bond really started back in year 2007. But back then, it was only the mainland financial institutions who were allowed to issue RMB bonds. It's not really until um, really the second half of last year that the whole RMB bond or what we call dim sum bond market start to really grow exponentially. And if you are, for those of you who are interested in how the word dim sum bond came into being, I'll be more than happy to share that with you later on. Um, but uh, in, in also in size perspective, so far since 2007, roughly uh, 20 billion US of RMB bonds have been issued, um, but the bulk of it, more than half, about 11 billion of that, 20 billion, has been issued in the first eight months this year. So you can see basically the, 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 the phenomenon of growth, and I think the basic, the ba main change has been since the beginning of last year, China has now allowed for all overseas corporates multinationals to be able to issue RMB bonds in Hong Kong, which previously they weren't allowed to, and using the proceeds to then onward invest into China. 
So that has been the major change. Uh, and that's where we see, as Anita suggested, there were a lot of uh, multinational names who already have a huge amount of business and, and keen to expand in China, wanting to use this particular channel and use this particular instrument to expand the businesses. And so far, I think the, um, we have seen from US would be your McDonald's, your Caterpillar, locally here, um, uh, Unilever, your Tesco's, your BP just did their, their deal last week, priced very, very attractively, three years at 1.75%, um, and also Volkswagen, Oryx, et cetera. So you can see the, 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 the cross-section of, I would say, corporates keening to tap this market, and equally, of course, mainland. Uh, three weeks ago, the, the Ministry of Finance, which is equivalent to a sovereign bond in China, issued their uh, bond in Hong Kong, and interesting enough, they can raise debt in Hong Kong cheaper than what they otherwise would be able to do so onshore. Okay, so it's a reflection of A, the demand for quality instruments, and B, more importantly also, as the supply of liquidity uh, in, in Hong Kong. And as, as Norman said, uh, the Vice Premier, again three weeks ago, Li Keqiang, tried to establish a stronger avenue of liberalization, which is to allow the FDI into China to be conducted through RMB. Previously, the whole 100 billion or 106 billion have predominantly been done through US dollars converted onshore in China through SAFE, and now you can actually do it outside of, of China and inject directly in RMB. And that from an issuer standpoint, if you are a multinational, if you're sitting here in the UK, you have that much more certainty of your ability to A, raise your investment outside cheaply and inject that money into your various projects in the various parts of, of China. Uh, in Hong Kong, this is where you will be able to have a huge amount of transparency, good law to govern them. You have access to a very, very big liquidity pool. If you think about Hong Kong, I think Gary mentioned about 9% of Hong Kong's deposit base is now in RMB, and that's equivalent to around 90 billion US dollars. This $90 billion is currently in search of quality instrument denominated RMB as an investment return. Okay, so if you want to raise it, you, you simply have a huge amount of access to a lot of institutional and, uh, depends on whether you want to go retail as well, but huge amount of institutional interest in, uh, in that particular bond. And now I would, I would just end by saying that the, the Ministry of Finance issue, uh, not only did we see interest from local in Hong Kong, not only did we see interest in US, Europe, but we also saw a lot of sovereign interest in Middle East and sovereign interest even in Africa. So you can, say, you can see that the world, in terms of central bank, the, the, the financial institutions are growingly interested to apportion part of their reserve into RMB. Uh, and that's where, in Hong Kong, you have a ready access to a network of quality institutional investors and if any, anyone of you will be interested down the road in accessing the market, I'm sure any of the banks on the panel would be more than happy to help you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, there's no doubt growing appetite among individual corporate institutions, even sovereign, in RMB investment products, financial products. Then it, it nicely brings me to the last panelist, Eric, um, stock exchange. You have one RMB real estate investment trust listed and a couple of bonds, uh, RMB bonds, but how do you see this financial product innovation going forward? Uh, how, how can stock exchange Hong Kong, uh, what sort of role it can play in promoting this particular area, which is in great need of development? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the question, Norman. I appreciate it. Um, I think that there is um, a few things that I'd like to highlight uh, first of all, uh, why companies should consider issuing equities to begin with? Uh, what are the benefits to doing so? Uh, what is the interest level among companies to do so? Uh, I would say, secondly, is you know what the structure of the types of offerings uh, that are currently available to corporates that are looking to to issue that, and then finally, what really the size of the opportunity and the depth and breadth of this opportunity are uh, in terms of RMB equity issuance or RMB other financial product issuance. Uh, as just mentioned, we did have our first uh, RMB REIT issued earlier this year. Um, it was uh, obviously, a, it demonstrated that we have the functional ability to not only 
issue different types of financial products in RMB, but also that we have the functionality to, to clear, settle, trade, uh, and, and uh, effectively uh, transact in these types of, of products as well. We also have, uh, as mentioned, there's been several dim sum bonds that have been issued in Hong Kong. Seven of those bonds are actually listed on the exchange as well. So we've already demonstrated our ability and our functionality on this front. Um, talking about the opportunity just very briefly and RMB deposits, which have been highlighted uh, to, a, to a very large degree, um, I can tell you that as a Hong Kong resident, I myself have for the past three years consistently put uh, a fairly large portion of my income, my monthly income, into RMB deposits. Uh, I won't see which bank because I don't want to upset the three speakers here. <laughs> uh, however, uh, I'm earning, uh, and maybe this will give it away, but I think I'm earning around 0.3% on those deposits. Um, so it's obviously not a very attractive yield. I'm obviously purely trying to play the Forex gain game, if you will, which has paid off fairly well. Uh, however, I certainly would like to have the opportunity to invest in other products that not only give me the opportunity for Forex gains, but also obviously the opportunity for capital gains. And I think this is really where part of that opportunity lies. Um, so let's talk a little bit about why companies should issue RMB denominated shares, uh, or equities in particular. Uh, first of all, the first several companies that do so, I believe, will have their profile raised dramatically in Hong Kong, in China, and throughout the rest of the world. Um, if you're one of the first companies to issue this, you will obviously get significant media coverage uh, around the world, and specifically in China and Hong Kong. Uh, finally, and secondly, I would say, uh, the FX risk obviously is lowered dramatically. Um, if you raise funds in RMB, you no longer have to convert to uh, re remit money back into China. You've already raised the funds in the currency that you want to use to deploy for capital use in China. Um, third, I would say that there is massive untapped investor demand. And I talked about the demand, for example, for, from someone like myself. I'm a very small player in this pool, obviously. However, I still would like to have the opportunity, and I think many Hong Kong citizens that have deposits in RMB would like to have the, have the opportunity not only to participate in the FX gains, but also have the opportunity to participate in capital appreciation. And then I'd say most significantly, um, and lastly, is the potential exposure to mainland Chinese investors. To give, put this in perspective, there are over 100 million individual investor accounts in mainland China. I think the velocity in mainland China and trading turnover is around eight times that of Hong Kong right now. Currently, mainland Chinese investors can only invest in Hong Kong through what's known as QDII schemes, or Qualified Domestic Institutional Investor Schemes. Back in 2007, that quota was around 20 billion. Today, it's around 67 billion. And we expect that number to continue to increase. So as the capital account opens up in China, as Chinese investors are increasingly allowed to invest overseas, we believe that there are two things that they will focus on. The first of which is that they feel comfortable in Hong Kong, because Hong Kong is part of China, and the bulk of the investment, as highlighted by the earlier speakers, is going to arrive or go through Hong Kong. Secondly, these investors would prefer to invest in securities that are denominated in their own currency. So we see this as a potential for a, lark, a likely massive re-rating in the equity markets in Hong Kong. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the Hong Kong equity market, several years back there was something that was called the through train. Now, the idea behind the through train was that all mainland Chinese investors were going to be able to invest directly into Hong Kong equities. We then saw the Hang Seng Index over the course of five to six weeks move from 23,000 and change up to 31,000. And I apologize if my numbers are slightly off here, but I think that's the approximate level. Uh, once it was discovered that, they, that mainland China was going to slow down this process, wasn't going to allow it, the market promptly traded back down to around the 24,000 level uh, for the Hang Seng Index. And so I think that what this illustrates, obviously, is the tremendous opportunity for a likely market re-rating um, and for companies that issue RMB-denominated securities to participate in that re-rating. Now, lastly, I'd like to talk about some of the instruments that are currently available and that will be, be very soon available to corporates that are looking to tap and do RMB fundraisings. First of all, there are two 
I would say, two RMB IPO models. Uh, one is what we call single tranche, single counter. This model, in essence, is a pure RMB offering through which a company has a new counter. Uh, this is a company that has not raised capital in Hong Kong dollars before, and they purely want to raise RMB. Not Hong Kong dollars, but purely RMB. They then tap the market through what we call, again, the STSC, or the single tranche, single counter model. This is similar to what Hui Xian did when they raised the REIT. Um, the other model is what we call dual tranche, dual counter. And we are, I would say, approximately ready for this model as well. And really what the dual tranche, dual counter model means is that a company that has not listed in the past, so currently is private or hasn't listed in Hong Kong specifically, can raise capital in the form of both Hong Kong dollars and renminbi, and thereby creating two counters, each denominated in the respective currencies I just mentioned. Now, we are not dictating to companies what they should do in terms of their own fundraising. What we want to do is provide optionality, flexibility, and an opportunity to take advantage of this massive chance. Follow-on offerings are available to companies that have already listed on the Hong Kong Exchange, and follow-on offerings can be done in the form of a placement, in terms of a, a rights issue or an open offer, or lastly, in terms of a public offer or a combination of all three of the above. The question is, how does one balance the growth of RMB for trade and long-term investments flows against the fear of speculative capital, hot money, right? That, that, that's a crucial issue. Maybe I should try, have a go, and then maybe Gary and you can supplement. Um, to me, I think you remember the slide I showed you, then a slide with just offshore, uh, onshore market. There's a big river separating the onshore from the offshore, and there was no bridge linking the two markets. Now, you can argue in that kind of uh, 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 situation, it's easier, let's say, to monitor inflow and outflow capital because uh, there's no bridge and very hard to cross the river. And therefore, we can monitor so-called um, movements e easier. But under the internationalization scheme is actually not changing the fundamental rules of allowing trade and investment flows. I, I give example, let's say investment. For FDIs, a foreign company wanting to invest in a project, it doesn't matter, it's an it's a, it's a airport, tunnel, road, you have to apply to the relevant authorities mainland before you get approval. Now once approval is given, the different steps you have to go through, then the investor would remit, in the past, US dollars or Hong Kong dollars or Euro into mainland China. And then save the State Administration of Foreign Exchange would then convert the foreign currency into RMB, after which payments for land, equipment, wages can be made. That's the drill. What we're doing here is that none of these control procedures will be changed. The only change is that instead of remitting US dollars, or Hong Kong dollars to make the conversion, the investor, the foreign company, would actually remit RMB, either its own funding or money borrowed through from a bank or through a bond issuance. The project would still have to be scrutinized by the relevant authorities in the province and in some cases big project centrally in Beijing. So the control process will not be relaxed at all. It's only the currency type they provide a flexibility for the foreign investor to choose. That's the only change. In other words, provided that the control process for projects, foreign projects, are effective, the use of RMB as a means of payment, as a currency for payment, should not have any material impact on the control process. This is the kind of principle we talk about. Uh, another important principle is that Hong Kong has developed this offshore market in RMB. The market is beginning to pick up some debt and liquidity is increasing, improving, but still early days yet. But on the other hand, the principles, the basic principle for a free market is 
enshrined in the development of offshore markets. Basically, a company can come to Hong Kong, buy and sell RMB in the offshore market freely at market rates. But only when you have money, RMB crossing the border, go into mainland or from mainland out, then you are subject to the requirements and restrictions imposed by the main authorities. Let's say trade channels. I show you the bridge of trade. When you remit money into mainland China to, to pay for a, some goods or services, that have to be a genuine trade. This talk about speculative flows, for example, if the payment, there's no underlying trade transaction behind it, then you are against the rule, then it's not supposed to be done. That's something that I think the banks, HKMA and the People's Bank are taking it very seriously. The same for investment. You must have a genuine project for which payments, remittances are made. You cannot have a fake project and then remit money cross-border. That's against the rules in the mainland. So I think this is the, the kind of a long answer to a short question. Um, but Gary, anything you want to supplement on this one? Well, you know, real business versus speculation, actually. There's always speculative elements, you know, in the market for any currency. But then the question is, you know, what is your business purpose? If it's a real business purpose, you know, just try to handle it in normal business way. But if you're speculators, then it's another thing. But of course, you know, it's not, it's much, much more difficult as a, uh, for a speculator to transfer the funds across the border. So the Chinese authorities, you know, they're encouraging transfers against a real business background with trade. But, you know, if it's hot money flow in and out of China, it's under very, very tight control. But of course, you know, there's always channels underneath, but I don't think it's very convenient. Okay, I got the next question for Anita. Uh, the question is, what are the hedging instruments available for foreign companies to manage R&B exposures from, for example, trade or investment with China? Thank you, Norman, for the question. Uh, the um, hedging instrument, okay, so uh, we can look at both onshore and offshore market. Now, for overseas companies, naturally, the most convenient one is to access the offshore market. And I can talk a little bit about, you know, what are the current instruments that has developed and is available for the hedging purposes. For most of the, the corporates, when they actually have a hedging requirement in renminbi, uh, normally is in two categories, is in foreign exchange or is in interest rate. And there is also a time element in both, i.e. there may be a requirement for a forward transaction and there can be an element in terms of the optionality, i.e. Uh, whether it's FX option, interest rate option. Now, Hong Kong currently has uh, most of the products. I think the, the most products in terms of offshore renminbi hedging compared with any other market in types and also in terms of the turnover and liquidity, just simply because if we account for the renminbi trade settlement 80% and also we have the largest pool of liquidity and then we have the closest in terms of the cross-border, that actually makes any development of an offshore hedging instrument, investment instruments, the natural ground you know, for the development. Now, in terms of the hedging, we have both the deliverable and also the non-deliverable market. The non-deliverable market used to dominate, you know, the Hong Kong, you know, renminbi hedging market. But then, with the continuous liberalisation in an orderly fashion, we have actually more deliverables, you know, actually uh, emerges. And the good thing about the deliverables emerging is it also closed the gap between both the onshore and offshore pricing, and also closes the gap. Uh, between the deliverable and the non-deliverable market uh, to a certain extent. And again, it's a journey. Closing the gap is a good thing and good sign towards the development of a market-driven you know, interest rate and also FX. Now, in the FX market, in both, in, you have the spot FX, so i.e. if you want to hedge it, you can actually buy sell renminbi spot uh, in Hong Kong. 
And if you want to hatch out your foreign exchange risk in anticipation of your demand or supply in a future day, we have FX forward market. The liquidity is, in general, fairly good up to one year or sometimes two years. Uh, and then if you want to do a hedge against any instability of the interest rate movements of renminbi versus any relevant underlying counterpart interest rate you know you can also hedge it through you know a de facto cross currency interest rate but a fixed floating interest rate for renminbi can also be hatched so if you're willing to pay a fixed rate commitment for a renminbi over a period of time uh, by receiving a floating rate, we also have the fixed uh, floating, i.e. the interest rate swap. And more recently, the option market also developed. So you have the option market, but I have to quantify, obviously, the option market you would expect would have lower liquidity compared with the FX forward and also interest rate swap market because it's a derivative you know, against you know, the underlying. So that's a journey. And then you obviously have got investment hedging, you know, not necessarily through uh, derivatives. You can actually go and buy bonds, uh, go and do FX linked deposits, structured deposits, etc. This would also provide you with certain hedges for some of your investment needs. Um, and we're also developing a interest rate curve, which I think a lot is looking forward to, because otherwise, how can you benchmark? Now, in order to develop the interest rate curve to do hedging effectively, you need to have the underlying critical mass of the various dots of the various tenor of the interest rate. And this is evolving. We also have renminbi uh, offshore spot fixing. So I think, you know, uh, with, with the development in onshore, uh, the development offshore market performs a very good complementary uh, perspective and also is developed a ground for a genuine market driven uh, demand and supply determined pricing whereas in China you still have certain administered you know interest rate situation uh, that is currently still governed by the regulators. Thank you. Gary? May I? Just, just one point. Talking about the yield curve, actually, the yield curve, first of all, is not complete in Hong Kong yet, but there's some interesting developments in the last few months. First of all, ADB, Asia Development Bank, made an issue of 10 year, small amount, 10 year bond. But MOF, Ministry of Finance, came to Hong Kong actually last month, made, you know, uh, serious tranches bond issues in various tenors, three, five, seven, ten years. The purpose of that actually, they told us straight and direct is that they want to build a complete yield curve for RMB. So that for whatever purpose, you know, to benchmark your products or hedging so that in the future will be easier for people to do yeah, offshore. And also the, the Ministry of Finance have indicated that uh, they're planning to have a regular issuance program in Hong Kong with different uh, tenors, with a view to establish a, a reliable, uh, I would say, risk-free benchmark for RMB uh, uh, fixed income products. I think this is something which is very encouraging. Now, the next question is for Ben. Uh, it relates, this question relates to RMB bond issuance, dim sum bond issuance. Uh, are there restrictions on the use of proceeds raised in dim sum bond issued in Hong Kong? Can proceeds be remitted to mainland China freely, and why why are the RMB dim sum bond interest rates are so different or lower than those in the mainland? Okay. Um, first of all, I, I think uh, you have to realize currently all dim sum bonds investment, onward investment into China has to be approved on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. That's a, that's a current rule. Um, and depending on where your investments are going, let's say if you want to invest uh, a part of your money in Shanghai, a part of your money in Beijing, a part of money in Guangzhou. Unfortunately, currently you have to apply to three different government officials uh, and do so. Um, and the, probably the good news is this is exactly where uh, the Chinese authorities are trying to address, streamline, and hopefully relax um, some of the restrictions so that 
overseas investors will know categorically um, what are the projects they can uh, invest into, what are projects they can't invest into. I don't have the answers yet because these rules have not necessarily been publicized yet, but um, if I dare make a broad um, uh, stab at it, I, I think if you try to invest in property, I think that will be a tough one. If anything else, if you go to retail, it is as, as, as normal as if you want to build um, an airport, a bridge, um, open franchises, etc. I think you can you can assume that that can be done, even though that currently still takes time. It currently takes roughly anywhere between three to six months, depending on how the procedures go. That is exactly where I think the mainland government are trying to streamline and make it a little bit more um, efficient. When it comes to RMB bond market rates. I think ultimately that's a function of demand supply. Currently, as uh, my friend over here is doing, he's uh, allocating uh, a, a portion of his um, huge salary and net worth <laughs> into RMB, right? So he's converting um, with the anticipation of two things. One is perhaps um, looking at the currency side of things, and the other side will be on the rate side. Um, and if there are greater demand, let's say, as I said, there are 90 billion of RMB deposits sitting in Hong Kong. They are all in search of quality instruments. He places in a bank and earns 0.3%, which he's not happy with. He'd like to get access to a little bit more yield pickup, right? So if there are other instruments that are paying a little bit more, and I'm sure he's happy to diversify some of that money, into into uh, into some of these instruments. That that's a, it's entirely driven by demand supply, and I think if two thirds, based on your chart, um, Norman, that about two thirds of the the money currently the deposits sitting in Hong Kong are institutional investors. They are all again looking for quality in instruments. That's why the yield is currently commanding at a lower level than it is onshore. I think, hope that, that addresses the question. Yeah, and I supplement that point. I think uh, I mentioned that in, in the offshore market in Hong Kong, basically we operate free market principles. Uh, ben, you're right, and actually say if, if an issuer having issued a bond in Hong Kong and want to remit the RMB into mainland China, that's cross-border, therefore has to be subject to the approval of the authorities. Now, at the moment, it's case by case. It doesn't mean it can be done, except you don't have a high degree of certainty. But going forward, I think the, the uh, Ministry of Commerce has already announced a, 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 a set of draft rules uh, for consultation. That intention is to get it, uh, formal rules uh, promulgated very soon. People's Bank is also working on a set of rules to facilitate the use of RMB. Uh, for FDIs into China. So this is happening because the Vice Premier Li Keqiang uh, make a commitment to have this ready ASAP. Now, we did have several issuers of dim sum bonds in Hong Kong, the offshore issuers, and they did not use the proceeds for payments in mainland China. So in that sense, they did not need to seek approval from any mainland authorities. They just go and comply with the regulatory requirements in Hong Kong, and then go ahead. How much they want to issue, what interest rate, the tenor, is entirely up to the issuer, just like a Hong Kong dollar bond or US dollar bond. I think that's the point I want to emphasize. Now, the question about rates. Again, I refer to this slide I used, where there's an onshore market, where there's a very deep, liquid, very huge RMB markets with deposits and then investment financing. But the offshore market, we have a situation in which the deposit base has been building up very rapidly. But because segregation, even though there are bridges, the bridges are not totally wide and for all the traffic to go in and out freely, that means there will be segregation between the two markets. As a result, the supply of Hong Kong dollar funding is abundant at the moment in Hong Kong. But the demand for it, whether it's bond issuance and financing is low, as a result of which, therefore, the interest rate in Hong Kong are much lower than those of mainland. But this is a pure supply-demand situation. Gary, what yeah, do you say? Norman, this is one point I'd like to supplement. Actually, uh, uh, the proceeds you get from the bond issuance in Hong Kong, of course, under capital accounts, 
you need the case-by-case -case approval from the authorities from SAFE. But you can perfectly use it to settle your trade. You know, even though you, use, you, you raise your proceeds by issuing a bond in Hong Kong, but, you know, if you have an import from China and you want to pay it in RMB, but at the same time expecting some revenues from China, be it in capital or current account, you can perfectly use it to trade, to pay for your trade, and then, of course, use your future revenue in RMB to repay the bond. So, under current account, there's no control whatsoever to make payments. Cross-border payments, no control. But only under carry account, there is need for approval for any of the transfer, major transfers. I just want to, want to clarify that. Uh, Anita? I just want to add one point to, uh, uh, on this interest rate differential. Uh, Eric mentioned that he gets 0.3%, right, for this uh, remedy process. Just to give you a little bit of color as to why, you know, uh, the other perspective is why bonds, dim sum bonds, can be raised at such a low interest rate. The same tenor of uh, the remedy deposits onshore, if you put it for three months, you can actually make over 3%. And in Hong Kong, in any of the offshore market, deposits basically is very low. So if a deposit deposit alike, because it, this is not this two market onshore and offshore, so that actually explains even at one and a half percent offshore is already very attractive, mm -hmm. and and that's that's one thing. Now the other thing about adding on what Gary mentioned about you know if you issue a bond in Hong Kong in RMB, technically speaking, if you are a importer in, in trade. If you have a transaction with a Brazilian company or an African company where you're importing in machinery or whatever, you know, you can actually pay them in RMB. And there's no regulations. And then whoever is receiving this RMB can actually open a RMB account, a corporate nature account, and deposit that RMB in that account. Uh, you don't need to necessarily remit back to China. But if you remit back to China, there is a regulations. Thank you. Uh, talking about uh, in search for yields, uh, this question for you, Eric. <laughs> it's a very simple one. I'm not quite sure you can answer it. When is the first RMP IPO expected? <laughs> um, well, that's a very good question. Um, actually, we, we, we are seeing significant interest. I, I can't cite any specific companies, and I can't give you uh, a specific timetable. Uh, we are optimistic that we will see um, some IPOs, uh, hopefully before the end of this year, or at a minimum some follow-on issuances in the form of RMB from currently existing issuers. So um, it's something that I've been tasked with, and uh, I probably won't be sitting here next year if I don't get something done relatively soon on that front. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we are probably coming towards the end of the session, but can I just conclude by making a few brief comments? Uh, I think we are all familiar with China's growth story, and the story, the growth story, continue to become more impressive, more prevalent, given the uh, slowdown in economic uh, growth in the advanced economies. And the question for businesses, for people in the UK and elsewhere, is that whether you want just to be a, a bystander of this China growth story, you want to be part of it. And there's only one way you can be part of it, is actually to join in, to be either investing and trading with China. And that must be the way to go forward. And uh, in that sense, of course, lots of people have been thinking about, I'll go into China direct, but there are uh, reasons, there are kind of rules, especially capital account uh, restrictions, that you cannot do so freely. And Hong Kong is actually your gateway in accessing China. And also tapping the, into the possibilities of vast uh, demand for investment from China to the rest of the world. Uh, I think Law Sassoon this morning talked about Chong Kong's investment in the infrastructural project in the UK. There's a very uh, uh, high profile, very uh, sizable investment. But I could equally see a lot more to come because China is a big saver. The savings need to find outlets, not just domestically, have to be go overseas. That's why in one of my slides, I said I would not be surprised in a few years' time, China's ODIs could equal or surpass 
the very impressive FDI numbers. You're talking about over 100 billion US dollars equivalent, equivalent a year. And that is enormous business opportunities for corporates, trading firms, financial institutions, especially banks. I hope we have been able to explain to you why we're here, because we believe that RMB internationalization will proceed and will proceed very quickly. Offshore RMB businesses will, will sort of uh, develop very rapidly in many overseas centers, especially in London. And of course, London has its own trade and investment hub and lots of huge links with Hong Kong and China, but we are into a new era. The new era is, is the use of RMB, which, is, which has not been done before. It doesn't matter whether you are a company, big corporates, or SMEs, or you are a bank, because there are lots of ways that Hong Kong can help you to build and develop your offshore RMB business here. It's not a question that if you develop RMB business, then Hong Kong stands to lose, or vice versa. It's actually the opposite. It's that if we can help you to develop more efficiently, more effectively, your RMB business to meet your corporate customer demand, we are in a win-win situation. You do more trade investment in China, and we help you, and we take a share. And this is a mutual beneficial uh, arrangement. And therefore, I think, uh, I hope we've been able to uh, explain to you uh, the way in which, the ways, in fact, there are many ways in which we can help you. If you are a bank, you could consider becoming a participating bank, linking up to uh, Gary Kerr's uh, clearing platform. Or if you are corporate customers with trade investment links, you could choose to open accounts with any of the banks in Hong Kong. I just mentioned this ratio is actually rising of overseas corporates opening RMB deposit account in Hong Kong. Or if you are companies or banks, you do not want to have direct access to the Bank of China platform, you could consider using any of the banks in Hong Kong with this global uh, network. Standard Chartered Bank, HSBC, are just a few we, we could name, there are others. And therefore, I think there are different ways in which Hong Kong can serve you as a gateway or springboard of tapping into China's growth story.